Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, when he heard that Ob Nixilis was wandering the streets of New Capenna, he decided to start calling him Mob Nixilis. It's Matt Morgan. So Joey, what is a sea monster's favorite meal? Mm, I'm not even sure that I want to venture at a guess. Why don't you tell me? I'll just tell you that it's it's fish and ships. Fish <laughs> and ships. Uh, in case you needed a joke written by a seven-year-old, there it is. I, I like, Matt, I really like that. Oh, they, they uh, absolutely wrecked that joke. It was so good. Ah, wrecked. I like it. Up next, he's having a hard time distinguishing between the new John de Charm and the card that's actually called John de Charm. It's Dana Roach. Uh, what do you get when you cross the cabaretti with the brokers? Um, those are the new, uh, the three color on, on new Capenna. Yeah. I'm not sure. You get killed. Okay. You know what? I admit I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I, I did not see that coming. Little, little new Capenna humor for you there, Joey. New, new Capenna humor even. Anyway, this is the EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the Commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new Commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Matt, I'm going to ask you this one. What are we talking about in this week's episode? Um, this week, we are finally going to take Dana to task and tell him to play more <laughs> basics in his decks. And actually, we're just going to discuss just mana bases in general this episode. Yes, yeah. That that adage that we've heard a lot from you of play more basics, and especially we're joined by one Dana Roach who plays like Does two not. basics in some of his decks sometimes. And we just want to investigate the tension between the number of basic lands in your mana base and all of the utility lands that you play in your mana base and... The pros and cons of uh, some of those balances and how difficult it can be to find that balance. It should be really interesting. Real quick, before we get into our show, I want to give a quick thank you to Chase, a.k.a. Mana Curves, for assisting me with the post-production of the podcast. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors for the show as well. The EDH Recast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and TCG Player, the Michael Corleone and Tony Montana of online <laughs> retailers. Just go to EDH Rec and click on the card in question and choose the vendor link down below. Doing so supports both the site and the show. And if you'd prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDHRecCast, where we have patron tiers of all levels, whether you want to join the Discord community, whether you want to see all of our historic challenge stats picks, or you maybe want to see all the shows a day early. There's all that and more available for you over at patreon.com slash EDHRecCast. And you can even do that and get the coveted weekly shout out for one single patron every single week. And this is a perk just for joining up and we just want to say thank you so much so this week rob peterson thank you so much for being a patron of ours we definitely appreciate the support and uh, thank you for joining thank you so much rob it really means the world that y'all make this show happen it's it's terrific okay let's get into our topic here we're talking about that adage of play more basics. We're talking about the tension between the basic lands and the non-basic lands that can happen in your deck. And and I guess, Dana, my question to you is just why is this so hard, man? <laughs> so, okay, I don't think Matt's wrong. I think okay. you should play more basics. You should play but, more basics. But I'm not going to do that. I was waiting, I was waiting that. for the butt. I was waiting so, for the butt. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this back to, to the early days of World of Warcraft. I, I played a lot of – I played a Warlock quite a bit. Okay. And I remember telling people – like telling other new Warlocks who I would be playing with in a dungeon and they would like use their fear spell on some creature. I'm like, don't use fear in a dungeon <laughs> because the creature runs off and aggroes a bunch more creatures and brings them all back. But I would use fear in a dungeon because <laughs> I knew how to use fear correctly. Like there were other spells. There was a spell called Curse of Recklessness that you could use to turn off fear if the creature got out of range. So if you were careful, you could do it correctly. I could use fear in a dungeon, but they shouldn't have been using it. I, I can I build my decks in a certain way and I understand their risks versus rewards. And I'm aware of the problems with not running enough basics, but I would say – Particularly newer players should just run more basics and not like try to do as I say, don't do as I do, basically, until you're much more entrenched. That's just what I was about to say. I'm like, this is the do as I say, not as I do yes, episode. Absolutely. Featuring one 
Dana, Je- Sarah, Jessica Parker Roach <laughs> over here. Yes. Who, like, I, I am actually, I want to ask, do you know which of your commander decks has the fewest number of basics in it? And do you know what the number is off the top of your head, even if you could venture a guess? I'm very curious. Um, my three color deck, my crush deck has six. Six basics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a couple of two color decks running eight. I... D- Daniel <laughs> Robert Brown Roach, what is going on with you? Like, Matt, all I can say is help. Uh, like, okay, so so I get it. I, you know, I, I get it because utility lands in your decks can provide you with so much value. When you get a reliquary tower to give you an infinite hand size, that's amazing. And there are new lands from the Kamigawa, like the new Beseju, for example. Terrific. That, like, you'd be leaving value on the table not to play some of these cards, you know? Like, some of them, I get why they're so appealing. But Dana... <laughs> Six, six basics in a three color deck is is weird, and eight basics in a two color deck it stresses me out, my guy. So, so there's a lot of factors, and we're going to go into a lot of these factors about about when those things cause you problems and when they don't. And <laughs> I am somebody who's been playing long enough and has access to enough cards that also I can offset some of those problems too. One of the problems with not running enough basics is usually because. For example, you're running a ton of utility lands, um, which make colorless mana almost all the time, which can cause problems with your color fixing. Um, but I'm someone who's been playing long enough that I, you know, I have access to original dual lands and fetch lands and things of that nature. So, so around my utility lands, I tend to have a very good mana base that oftentimes offsets the fact that I have a good amount of utility lands in my deck. So, like. It, it's the, the math of what makes it work and what makes it not work is very, very complicated and doesn't necessarily apply to everyone either. Well, and I don't even think that you need the original duels like you mentioned to have sure. a, a, a fully functioning mana base, with, with, especially with how many dual lane cycles we've gotten, whether a rare or common or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can very easily be playing entirely non-basics without any utility lands and still have all your mana fixing. But mm-hmm. the problem there is you're going to get a lot of lands that come into play tapped. You're going to get a lot of right. lands that... Um, you can't fetch, like say you cast a cultivate. Uh, you're not going to be able to get uh, any of your guild gates or your uh, whatever it is, whatever those land cycles are. You're not able to get those, and that's where I have a, probably the biggest struggle with not playing enough basics. Is if you're playing five or six even ramp spells, you can. If you're only playing eight basics, you're going to run out really, really quickly, and eventually you're going to draw a, a ramp spell. And you don't have any basics to pull out. Um, so if you're playing green, chances are you're, you're probably not playing enough basics because that's a majority of what green does. Now, yes, there are cards like Farseek or uh, if you're playing white and you're trying to just grab lands out of your deck, Oresco Explorer and cards like that. Those also will grab planes cards, not specifically basic planes, but they're more often than not, if you're playing any sort of spell that's grabbing basics out of your deck, or grabbing lands out of your deck, I should say, it's going to be basic lands specifically, unless it's something extremely powerful. It is a little funny to me, Dana, that your response to, oh, I have a high number of non-basic utility lands in this deck is, it's okay, I'm running a lot of other non-basic lands in my deck too. Sure. Like, <laughs> I, I, get, I get the logic, but there is a slight irony about it. But I, I will say that in my own experience, this is something that I struggle a lot with in my Thalese deck, um, that is a, a black-white token deck. And there are a lot of really fantastic uh, utility lands that I want to play in that deck, such as cards like Foundry of the Consoles, for example, or even Command Beacon, uh, because my commander costs a lot of mana and having little things in the mana base uh, that can give me extra value. Maybe this colorless land can also make me some tokens or Command Beacon can get my commander back to my hand so that I can save mana on it because she can get a little bit expensive. Or Vault of the Archangel, huge, amazing card to have in that deck, but it does produce colorless mana. And despite the fact that I feel, I mean, I don't have duels or whatever, but I do feel like I have a lot of really great other uh, color fixing uh, non-basic lands in the deck too. That deck is still one that struggles a whole lot because there are so many of these non-basic lands that I want to play that are still getting in my way. And the color fixing can help, but only sometimes. It's really tough to go from a card that costs triple black to a card that costs triple white from one turn to the next when you have a Field of the Dead that is also producing colorless lands and the Vault of the Archangels and all of those. Like It it does feel to me that like a high density of color fixing lands can sometimes help, but I don't think it 100% of the time is going to help. Yeah, eventually you're going to run out of that resource of having certain co- like colored mana because of your, your dual lands. Uh, and it's it's a real balance because, like you mentioned, Joey, if you're playing even two colors and sometimes playing 
you know, a handful of, of lands that only make colorless mana. And those three color decks, like you look at the top utility lands on EDH rec, a lot of them are in Naya colors. So you could be playing at least 10 lands in, in the average deck that don't make colored mana. So that either puts a lot of pressure on your mana fixing, or you have to cut down on those utility lands because you're just not going to be able to cast those colored spells, especially with with new Capenna coming up and you're having all these three color things coming out. I mean, granted, we have the Triumphs and stuff like that now too, but mana hungry decks and three colors, you don't have a lot of room for utility lands because you need that colors. And in, in fact, honestly, Matt, I would posit a thing here. I think that the decks that struggle the most with color fixing might not even be three, four color decks because the fact that you are playing a deck that has such a high demand on its colors subconsciously encourages you to play more of those mana fixing and play a lot fewer of those colorless uh, utility lands right off the bat. Like maybe you'll have room for the Reliquary Tower or something like that or a Scavenger Grounds, but you might not dare to go too far afield beyond that point. But in a two color deck, you don't feel the pressure as much. It's two colors and just subconsciously you're like, oh, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to get away with having a bunch of colorless lands, but that can be the thing that trips you up. So I actually think that color fixing might be in some cases, more difficult for two color than for three color decks, just because of our subconscious biases about how well our color fixing will work out that we're not always aware of and haven't uh, tested out as much. Whereas in a three or four color deck, we already know that we don't have a lot of room for colorless lands. And that's definitely something I am conscious of and factors into my decision making for cards I put into decks. I am aware that because of how I brew, um, and I tend to run a lot of utility lands, I do have to be cautious of, of my colors in my decks. So like, for example, in my two color blue decks, um, I have ones where I'm not even running the original counter spell because I just don't want to deal with worrying about double blue mana. So like I tend to lean into the arcane denials and the um, the stubborn denial kind of spells, the swan songs, the any kind of a counter spell basically that I can cast for it only requiring me a single blue, I tend to lean that direction because I know double blue is kind of tricky, particularly if I want to do other things during my turn for blue that, that require blue mana. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely affects how I build the deck, but it, but at least, again, I, I've been playing and do this long, doing this long enough that I'm aware of what those problems are and I'm able to kind of build around them in a way maybe a newer or less entrenched player wouldn't really realize until it, they were at that moment where they find themselves unable to cast or, or leave mana up for a counter spell, you know, multiple different times. So, so why don't we go over then the pros and cons of running these non-basics, not just basic, mm-hmm. not just utility lands, but like non-basics, because there's pros and cons to both, really. Yeah, uh, very true. Like pros of playing the non-basics, certainly a lot of them will help out with your color fixing. Uh, some of them uh, can do mana acceleration for you. Uh, that's a reason that, Dana, I know you love playing your Nykthos so much and why I love me a Cabal Coffers or... Even an ancient tomb is another great example as well. Like you can get mana acceleration from a bunch of these non-basics. Um, and I think I mentioned before, there's a lot of free value that you can get from these. It's not taking up a card slot in your deck. So it feels terrific. I mean, it's basically free to have these effects just right there in the mana base and you don't have to dedicate spell slots to them. And I, I mean, frankly, there's a reason that Dana brings his emotional support scavenger grounds to every single deck that he plays <laughs> because it yeah. saves his life. Like there are a bunch of those lands that can prevent you from dying because they might have one of those effects that knocks out someone else's really amazing uh, strategy going on over there. You know, the, the emotional support, but bogs, I'm not bitter about them, I promise. But like I play them, too, because, yeah, those are absolutely terrific for you and they can save your save your bacon. I was playing in a game last night where um, because of some some top of the deck manipulation, we uh, we all saw that a player had a Rise of the Dark Realms <laughs> um, available like in, in his hand, and I just pointedly kept my Homeward Path untapped for you know four turns. There you like, go. Yeah, okay. It was it was taxing me a single mana, but I, I was keeping that person from playing what was basically a win condition. So yeah, I think like those utility lands can actually keep. I mean, it can win you games in the case of like the Cabal Coffers or Nykthos. They can keep you from losing games in the case of like a Scavenger Grounds or the Homeward Path too. Very true. Yeah, and it's all about just. How often are you going to be able to reliably activate whatever that utility is that the land is, is bringing there? I don't run a lot because I often find that I, it, what, they're sometimes just over-costed versions of actual spells. Mm. Um, I know one of the most played utility lands around is Alchemist Refuge, which you can pay effectively three mana. It's a, a green, blue, and then tap the Alchemist Refuge itself. And you can play non-land cards this turn as though they had Flash. 
that's powerful, but that's that's like I said, that's effectively three mana, which is a lot because you could be doing other things or just playing instance anyways. And so I struggle being able to activate Alchemist Refuge. I've tried it in a few decks, and I would find that what I was trying to do, you have to leave up eight mana at that point <laughs> to be able to use things on other people's turns. And that's just, that's a lot of it. You're, you're basically taking a turn off to cast one spell when you could be casting two spells instead. I just, I never found myself activating a lot of those, especially the original uh, from Innistrad, that whole block, that whole cycle. I've just never found myself leaving up enough mana mm. to be able to activate them reliably. And I know Dana, especially you, you probably have very different experiences than I do with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think definitely your personal play style makes a big difference too and how some of these things work. Absolutely. That's that's definitely something. And Alchemist Refuge is not one that I've personally used much. I, I actually tend to not have great luck with it either. But yeah, there's definitely some cards that just play better in some people's hands than others for sure. Well, and so now, Matt, you said let's talk about pros and cons. Cons of playing a bunch of non-basics, they can cost you tempo. There are a bunch of these color-fixing lands that do still come in tapped, or even utility lands that definitely come in tapped. I mentioned Field of the Dead earlier. That one comes in tapped. It's a terrific card, but it does come in tapped. And it actually, you know, this is another con. It's a colorless land, and that can actually muck up your color-fixing effects, which... So it, there's a, a benefit to non-basics, but there's definitely, you know, a, a con over here to them as well. Uh, they can cost you life. I know that this is, you know, a shock land is certainly a cost I'm willing to pay, but a bunch, a, a deck that has a bunch of fetch lands and a bunch of shocks or even that ancient tomb, that can add up. That can certainly set you behind if you aren't paying close enough attention and you're using your life as a resource a little bit too wantonly. But then also, Matt, I got to say, I think that you as a player are one of the cons to playing too many non-basics as well, because some of the stuff that you are up to in your decks will definitely punish people for the non-basics that they're playing. Oh, yeah. I mean, Dana actually gave me one of my favorite new cards that I've discovered. Uh, Primal Order is a card that is fantastic <laughs> for punishing people, and it's not taking them out of the game. I know there's a lot of non-basic land hate, the Blood Moon, Back to Basics. Those are some kind of boogeymen of the format for a long time. But Primal Order is that sweet spot where it's not stopping anybody from playing. Nobody's locked out. It just does incremental damage. Uh, it basically, yeah, it deals damage to every player on their upkeep equal to the number of non-basics they control. So it's not stopping them, but also is an actual win condition <laughs> where you're actually winning instead of just stopping other people from playing. I think Primal Order, uh, Dana, I know that you gave me this original idea, <laughs> but I, I love Primal Order. That's probably one of the, the best ways to punish people for non-basics. And you've absolutely punished me with it before and done a good a bit of damage to me. <laughs> it's true. Um, but I guess that's so, – so let's talk about a few of these cons here. We can go back and, and, and address a few of them because those are absolutely cons. Um, but they're not necessarily deal-breaking cons. Mm -hmm. So talking about the Primal Order, Back to Basics, Blood Moon cards of the world that that punish non-basics. Well, they, they do punish non-basics, but like there's also some kind of game theory involved in here. Um, and I'll use myself for an example, someone who plays at a shop with a large player base. So no one is really metagaming against anyone, especially against me in particular. Mm. Um, so that means to, to see a back, back to basics or a Blood Moon or a Magus of the Moon in a game or something, the person has to, number one, have a deck that supports it, which means they're not themselves running a bunch of utility lands and, and dual lands. Sure. They have to, of course, find that card in a game um, and, and get it out against me. And then they have to not have it get removed long enough to cause me problems. That's a lot of things that have to simultaneously occur frequently to punish me for running non-basic lands in my decks um, comparative to the amount of times me having a bunch of utility lands or really good color fixing gives me an advantage. And for myself, at least, you know, I, I haven't like done the math and made notes about how often it comes up, but the amount of times Matt's burned me with a primal order definitely feels much smaller than the amount of times me having that scavenger grounds to stop a big graveyard play or the homeward path to just take back the card someone briberied from me when they weren't paying attention to my homeward path. <laughs> um, I feel like those things happen way more frequently than the amount of times that Primal Order burns me or the Blood Moon burns me. So, so, so there's definite downsides, but like you can also make the argument that the upsides offset those downsides, depending on your deck construction, depending on where you play, that kind of thing. 
And I also think that a lot of these, the heavy Punisher effects, uh, Back to Basics and Blood Moon are kind of the, the poster children for this. Sure. Rule Zero has kind of put these on a soft ban list almost, if that makes any sense, where mm. messing with people's fundamental resource, their mana base, that's probably the ultimate feel bad. That's why Armageddon and, and all types of mass land destruction effects in Commander aren't really played all that often in a lot of playgroups because it creates these board states where people can't play. And that's the last thing a majority of players want to do is they they want to be able to play. So these rules, like, I feel like the social aspect of the format has really helped with getting Blood Moon back to basics and those types of cards. They're being played less and less. And not that they're any less powerful, definitely not, because we've gotten even more powerful utility lands, even more powerful dual lands. So... This is one area where I've kind of softened on my you need to be playing more basics and I've leaned towards Dana's thought process because Blood Moon and all these types of effects where it effectively shuts off non-basics, they're kind of getting crept out of the format. Well, in, in speaking for myself, I have a mono blue deck and I have a mono red deck that are running a large amount of basics. I could very easily support back to basics in that blue deck and blood one in my red deck, mm -hmm. but I don't run either. And it's not even necessarily a rule zero situation so much as it is they're not particularly fun. Like, right. like I get no enjoyment. Absolutely, yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't do anything for me to play a Blood Moon and and have somebody else not be able to play. I'd rather play a card that lets me like take somebody out than play a card that makes somebody sit there. So like like there, there's there's definitely rule zero, but there's also the 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 aspect of it's just not what I want to be doing in a game too. So so myself, I don't even use them. Yeah, I, I mean, and and y'all y'all know me. I'm a guy who literally might. My commander meta includes my family, sure. <laughs> making their stuff not be able to untap. Yeah, not usually the type of gameplay experience that I pursue. <laughs> like when I play my zombie deck, I play it like a zombie. Like that's me. <laughs> I I would blood so. moon my family so hard. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> one of the other ones that got mentioned was was the cost the tempo one. I want I want to go back and address that too because mm. that that was definitely one that was a factor for me. You know, five years ago, six years ago, when I was building decks, I'd looking at my my land list and like, okay, well. Um, I'm going to put in the lands that don't hit my tempo and then, hey, I've got room for 12 or 14 basics or something. Um, but then we get, you know, the uh, a good dual land series that doesn't come into play tapped. We get the the battle bond lands or something or we get the the cycle that we just got in um, in Innistrad or we get the the MDFC dual land cycle that we got back in Strixhaven. Mm. Um, mm hmm. There's been enough cycles that we've got since then that like don't make it so you don't have to make the choice. When say the Theros lands came out or something, like, okay, well, is it worth pulling a basic for this dual land that comes into play tapped? Does the scry offset that? I'm not really sure. Um, when we got the Battle Bond lands, that isn't really a question. Or when we got the Horizon lands for Modern Horizons that can be cracked for a for a card draw. That becomes much easier to make that that decision then because you're not having to deal with the tempo loss. You just put in a really good land, and you're like, "Oh, I guess I'm pulling out a basic." Um, so that that's something I think that's that's gotten to be less of an issue as we've gotten these really good dual land cycles in the last three, four, five years. Yeah, the the, the quality of the dual lands in the format have gotten to. The, I I don't think you need the original, you know, uh, alpha beta unlimited for sure dual land cycles to have a quality functioning mana base. Oh, of course uh, not. I don't think that's the case at all because, like you mentioned, Dana. In Estrad 3, whatever set we're calling it with uh, Midnight Hunts and all that, <laughs> that gave us another great dual land cycle. We've gotten them over and over and over again. And then you know, the more that Wizards of the Coast reprints the Battle Bond lands and all those, we're just going to keep getting more and more. So like at this point, it, it's almost like foiling out your deck by putting duels in there. Like it, the It's marginal how much of an impact that does. Whereas oh, of course. 10 years ago, for example... When yeah, Theros lands the, the 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 temples, those were great. But we've that's ten years ago, which may as well be infinity years, right? Or a year ago on the internet. <laughs> so where will we be ten years from now when we have like another half a dozen cycles or something of, of duels? Yeah, that they're not they're going to try to make them be good. So like that's going to continue to be one of those weird push and pull things where you have to try to figure out mm -hmm. whether the you know the downside of pulling out those basics is worth the upside of having a good duel land. Yeah, we're gonna eventually we're gonna get to a point where the shock lands are. Eh. <laughs> and, and, and so speaking of shock lands, that was the thing we mentioned the the shocks and things like ancient tomb that do cost you life. Mm. Um, 
Now, ignoring the reckless way I trade life in, in games, even, even outside of that, though, <laughs> Commander's also gotten faster as a format. Mm-hmm. So the life loss, I think, has also gotten a little bit less relevant over the years because of the way the game goes. Maybe that life loss over the course of, you know, a 16-turn game mattered. It's probably <laughs> a, a little bit less impactful when games are going 10 turns or, or less than that in some cases. Or is the game getting faster because people are playing Ancient Maybe, Tomb sure. so much more? <laughs> that could be. <laughs> that's a fair is, point. Which is the cause and which is the reaction there? Right. No, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> That's really funny. And I think it's also worth pointing out that in the case of some of these cons, like these cons can be mitigated by different strategies. A life gain deck is going to feel a lot more comfortable playing stuff that causes you to lose life for those advantages because it's like, I don't care. I'm getting 20 life a turn. This is not an issue for me. And frankly, some of these cons are cons that we can turn into pros. I have a Graven Predator Captain deck where the life loss that my lands can do to me makes my commander more powerful. So there are certainly ways that you can twist these things into individual benefits. Well, I think this is one reason why, especially the the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, that rare land cycle is so ludicrously powerful because all the downsides that we kept mentioning, they're kind of getting mitigated more and more with all these different land cycles that we get. Oh, you mean like Baseju and the Ottawara and all of those those lands? Yeah, the the, the channel lands where you can mm. uh, they have the channel ability where you can pay whatever the mana cost is and discard it to then have whatever effect that is. Yes, Dana, you had a really really good thread on Twitter not too long ago talking about just how powerful these are on ways that you don't really notice at first look. Yeah, I, I, I was talking about a, a situation where we had a player who had a Glenelendra Archmage in play. Um, which is a card from from back in the lore when where you can sacrifice it to counter a target non creature spell. I, I cast an expedition map, and then you know the Glenelander player was like, "Yeah, I'll allow that to happen," because they weren't worried about me going to get a non basic land. <laughs> well, I was then able to use that to go get my Kamigawa land that I could channel, which then was also not something they could counter with a Glenelander Archmage. What to to deal with the problem the player had that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to deal with, you know. They're fantastic in a ton of ways, let alone the fact that there's just almost no opportunity cost to running them instead of a basic, short of the Blood Moon situation. They're just crazy, crazy good. Well, I will say there is, I think, a hidden downside to some of these. I I, I do think that there is, that this isn't a big downside to playing, for example, a Boseju um, in your mono green deck, but there are some types of downsides that aren't initially obvious, or at least cases where a basic land is going to be better than some of those cards. Again, this is a teensy downside compared to how amazing Beseju is as a card. But there are some effects, such as an extra planar lens or a gauntlet of power, for example, where you actually would prefer to have a basic land because those artifacts would increase the mana production from your basic lands. And the teeny downside, again, but it is technically still a downside, so I feel like I had to point it out. I mean, I also think that if you're playing decks that would be playing extra planar lens a lot, you're already playing a very high concentration of basics anyways. So what you're, you're probably not needing to, us to tell you you should play at least 10 basics because <laughs> I mean, you, you, well, you're you you're in one color, like you're monocolor. You don't have the opportunity to play a bunch of utility lands. Well, so, OK, but this is actually a thing that I've run into in my Titania deck, for example. In my Titania deck, that's a monocolor deck. So you would think that having a high number of basic lands is definitely in my best interest, especially because as a, a deck that cares about landfall, I, if I'm going to have the pair of Ramen Up Excavator and Evolving Wilds getting a bunch of lands out of my deck for landfall abilities in that deck, like I want a lot of basics and it's true. But it is a tough call there, even in a monocolored deck, because that deck's specific strategy wants a bunch of lands that can kill off my other lands. It wants the Lotus Fields. It wants to have um, a bunch of like Prismatic Vista type of effects. And that eats up a lot of card slots, like a lot of my land slots, like nearly 20 land slots with really enticing cards that will make themselves go to the graveyard so that Titania can see a land hit the graveyard and produce elemental tokens for me. So there is actually still a tension there among some of the monocolored decks. And that, that's just a, a thing that is certainly worth pointing out. Like finding a slot for a Baseju in that deck is definitely something I'm interested in doing whenever I can get my hands on a Baseju for that deck. But there is a cost there that is difficult, that doesn't initially seem like it should be. Yeah, right. I, I think for me, at least, that's definitely 
much more of an issue than it is in a two color deck or a three color deck. I, I am much more willing to deal with the downsides that come with non basics in a two or three color deck that we already talked about. Um, then I am surrendering the surrendering the power that comes with an extra planar lens or a high tide or a bubbling muck or, or the cabal coffers in a monocolor deck. That that's re really when I talk about having to weigh the the upsides versus the downsides. At least for me, I've always found, particularly in a monocolor deck, the upsides are so much more powerful. Being able to get like the double mana, especially. That I, that's where I tend to run really, really lean, and I'm very cautious about how many non-basics I run versus a two-color deck where I'm like, well, the difference between you know eight and six at that point, if a blood moon drops, I, I'm I'm in trouble anyway. So like, I might as well <laughs> put in the the Boseju and you know whatever other cool new land we just got. Somebody play Price of Progress against Dana. It'll deal like twenty damage, two damage right. for I each mean, non-basic yeah. he oh, controls. For sure. it'll yeah. just kill him straight yeah. up. Yes. <laughs> but but I, but I'm willing to accept that's going to happen. Like I'm going to eat I'm going to eat that price of progress and lose that game. But there'll be five or six other games where because of my mana base I'm going to be able to do things I couldn't otherwise do. So like it's you know, that's the trade off I'm okay with. Yeah. So so that's specific choices that you're making there. And and honestly I think there's still actually a lot more for us to dig into there about some of the things that encourage us or discourage us. But we might have to save that for the second half of the show because for now. It's time for us to pause and challenge the stats. There's so much data on EDA track, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards see too much or too little play, so we love challenging those statistics. So, Matt, instead of talking about non-basics, how about we challenge the stats for a little bit? What do you say? Well, I'm I'm going to take this opportunity to still talk about lands, if that's all right. Uh, I know it's challenge stats. Oh, <laughs> But we're, we're still going to talk about lands. Okay. Uh, so my challenge this week is going to be for landfall decks, actually. So still talking about lands, but I'm not going to talk about a land card specifically. So in landfall decks that are playing blue, I'm challenging the card Gush. So Gush is a four and a blue for an instant that says you may return two islands you control to their owner's hand rather than pay Gush's mana cost. And Gush is pretty straightforward. Draw two cards. That's all it does. But being an instant with an alternative casting cost you have so much potential to just be have these explosive turns, especially if you're playing in the typical landfall deck, ways to have additional mana or land drops per turn. This is just a great way to make sure your hand and your landfall drops are still coming at all stages of the game. So if you're playing Tatio over AC of Tyrant of Gyre Straits, two very, very popular landfall commanders, you don't want to be playing a lot of spells that are just kind of draw spells anyways, because your commander's already doing that. But having a way to, A, draw more cards, but also reset two land drops, this is quite a powerful card. And and uh, go figure, I'm calling back to a card that was, I guess, formerly Popper legal again. Uh, this card is actually banned in Popper now because that's just how good it is. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the fact that you're able to get two more land drops, so even if you're playing any of the, the Omnaths, for example, that are playing blue, uh, this is another way to get more land drops up off the battlefield into your hand so you can keep the, the landfall triggers going. This is just such a powerful card. And yes, you, you don't need a ton of draw spells in there, but the fact that you're able to keep the landfall triggers, we talk about all the time on the show, how landfall triggers are, it's a very finite resource because you only have so many lands in your deck. So being able to reuse those is something very, very powerful in addition to any other lands you might already be wanting to replay, like a Mystic Sanctuary, for example, is an island that you can pick up with Gush to pay the alternative casting cost, mm. and then you can still use that Enter the Battlefield ability of Mystic Sanctuary as well. So there's some nice, nice little synergy going on there uh, once you start looking into some of these non-basics with basic types that you, you have in the format now. Uh, currently, Gush is only played in 17% of Tatiova decks, 12% of AC decks. I think this is just such a powerful effect. You want to be giving this a second look if you're a landfall deck that has blue in it. That is pretty spicy, Matt. Um, and, and you know what? I am actually going to follow your lead here. I will also talk about non-basics in the challenge of stats because uh, I, I like it. You're a rebel with a cause. It, it's great. I'm, I'm, I, I'm I, have, I have so many causes. Don't you worry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will move here to, I have half a mind to challenge the card Command Tower in Landfall decks, specifically Omneth Locus of Rage, I think is a, a great example here. Um, about 66% of Omnath Locus of Rage decks play uh, Command Tower, but I don't know if they 
need it. Really, I'm kind of actually using this as a, a blanket way of uh, challenging any non-dual typed color fixing land in especially a two color landfall deck. Um, Rootbound Crag or Rockfall Veil vale would be another example of this. I just don't think that Omneth needs them. Basic lands, as we've mentioned a lot this episode, are like especially crucial to landfall decks because like Matt, you said at the beginning of the episode, if your Cultivate runs out of targets, well then Omnath stops making fun five fives. And if you run out of those basics in your deck, you could be up the creek without a paddle. And if you have a lot of dual typed lands that you can search out with your fetches and your three visits effects, then that will be really cool to get your color fixing that way. Cards like Cinderglade have both of those dual types, provide you both of those colors. But but yeah, landfall decks like Omnath flourish the most when they have a lot of basics and a couple fetch lands like, you know, your fabled passages um, and certainly bounce lands, returning lands to hand, like you said, Matt, is really good. So Gruel Turf is a really great option and the occasional odd utility land. But since the entire strategy is already fixated on fixing its colors just naturally in the strategy and finding so many lands, I think that the color fixing land slots are unnecessary. So you can use more basics to pack in more potential targets for when you're using those land finding spells instead. And you don't need to dedicate land slots to color fixing lands because the strategy is already doing it for you. So yeah, color fixing lands in especially two color landfall decks. That's my challenge. Matt, I'm not sure if you approve of this one. I know that you have an Omnath deck. But uh, this is just sort of where my head's at. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, I don't disagree. I, I think it is something that a lot of players need to consider. So I, I think this is definitely a player preference at that point. But the deeper you get into it, the, the harder it is to make any specific choice on your lands. It's so, so difficult. So, yes, I, I get where you're coming from. And I, I support this as just a challenge in general. It's just something for players to consider. Yeah, I, I would. I just like to prioritize if they're there to color fix, make sure that they can be searched by your spells. That's that's basically where I'm at. So a lot of the other ones that are just there for color fixing, the strategy does that a lot already for you. So that's fun. We kept on talking about lands and our challenges. Dana, are you doing the same? I mean, I will say that um, at least Matt's choice has had an entire book written about it. There's a book written about how to play Gush versus Command Tower. So I think maybe Matt does win that head to head. Wow. Yes. OK, there we go. <laughs> um, my challenge this week comes from a listener, Spencer, who uh, is known on Twitter as Common Spence underscore 16. Hmm. And the challenge is for the uh, card Scarab of the Unseen. So uh, respect for, from Spencer for sending me a really old card. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, this is from, from way back in Alliances. Um, it's an artifact that costs two mana. And you can tap it and sacrifice Scarab of the Unseen and return all auras attach a target permanent you own to its owner's hand, and then draw a card at the next turn's upkeep. Um, Spencer says he'd like to submit it as a challenge for any deck that's an enchantress-based deck where you are being rewarded for casting auras. It's currently only in 224 decks in EDH rec. And if you are playing a deck, particularly something like Sithis, where you want to cast auras and use those auras to draw cards, it's a good backup plan, number one, to save yourself if you are playing in a deck without blue and you run the risk of having your commander blown up and losing those auras. It's a pretty good backup plan to at least save them. But number two, being able to, if you are in need of some card draw, bounce those auras back and recast them all again just to draw another handful of cards. Um, it's by no means a crazy broken card, but there's a lot of situations where I agree with with Spencer, it's really, really solid and should see more play than just 200 decks. This seems insane for that new Light Paws Emperor's Voice Commander, yep. which finds auras whenever you play auras. And then this could save them all or let you recast like Sage's Reverie draws you cards for all of the auras that you play it so you could bounce it and then play more. Dang, this is this is like quintessential Dana and also quintessential our listeners are amazing at this. This is, this yes. is a top tier <laughs> yeah. challenge. I'm loving this. Yeah, that was a great pick. So thank you very much, Spencer. Appreciate it. Hot dang. Those those are cool. I'm I'm ooh, I'm really into that. Challenges has so much fun. Okay. Um so so now I guess, uh, Dana, you didn't have a, a challenge that was regarding uh, non-basic lands, but we will continue talking about non-basic lands now as we get back into the the back half of the show. And and I guess for me, I want to ask 
you know, going in, uh, digging a little bit deeper into the specific choices and the things that would encourage you to, in fact, play more basics, that's kind of what I want to get into. Like Matt, for example, had mentioned Mystic Sanctuary, which is a, it is an island that also cares about you having a greater number of islands so that it can get a bonus effect. Are there cards like that for you or, or strategies perhaps that you are like, okay, yes, I'm going to play a whole lot of basics now. Like where do you meet where Matt and I are usually at for most of our decks? I mean, sure. Yeah. It, it, there's definitely situations where it's, where it's worth running a lot of basics. I have a deck um, that cares about lands. So I mean, in Den deck, it's not necessarily a landfall deck. It's more of a land lands matters deck, but there's some landfall stuff in it. Um, so as a result, that deck is running, I think, 16 basics, <laughs> which isn't a crazy amount. But like, it's a lot more than the four or six I'm running in some of my decks. And, and it's because there's a reason to run basics in that deck. Matt talked about running out of lands that you searched for earlier. That's a deck that's doing a lot of land searching. So like, I want basics that I can go find um, there in particular. So there's, there's reasons for it. I, th I think you need to figure out what that balance is. Are there enough reasons to justify doing it versus the upside of running the utility and the mana fixing that comes with the good duels and the good utility lands? And in that particular case, it's worth me missing out on some utility lands to be able to go consistently fetch up lands and always have a landfall trigger available. Yeah, for me, uh, Perilous Forays is probably my favorite example of this. Uh, it's an enchantment for three green green that says you can pay one mana and sacrifice a creature and you search your library for a land with a basic land type and put it into play tapped and you shuffle your library. So, yes, we've mentioned a few times on this episode already how there are dual lands that have basic land types. The shock lands like Temple Garden, uh, Stomping Grounds, those are one of the most common ones. There's also the uh, Battle for Zendikar land cycle as well that had basic land types. Those are, are very, very powerful and you can get those. But for me, I mean, what's the most easy way and you might say the most basic way to have <laughs> lands in your in your library with basic land types? Just playing more basics. And so <laughs> stuff like that, is it, it just makes it, for me at least, with a lot of these decks that I'm playing Perilous Forays in, for example, Keeping the number of basics that I have in there is is rather important because in the deck specifically, it's my Omnath Lucas of Rage deck where I have Amulet of Vigor. So this, you know, those three pieces in there create a combo that's able to pull out all those lands and create a bunch of death triggers. And it's a, a very, very powerful synergy. So that deck specifically drives up the number of basics in the deck because I need them for Perilous Forays. Yeah, there, there's interesting stuff, too, about some of the cards in the 99 affecting the, the mana bases that you play. My uh, my Elegith deck comes to mind as an example of this. One of the reasons that I feel restricted in how many non-basic lands I can play in that deck is because that deck contains cards like Graven Lore and Merit Lage's Slumber, which care about having uh, snow mana. When I have snow permanents, they allow me to scry more. And since Elegith draws me cards, if I would scry, then I want to have more and more ability to trigger those cards to get a, a bunch of extra scry and make my commander even more powerful. And that causes me to feel a ton of pressure to play as many islands as possible, which is tough because I want to play a bunch of those things that will let me scry, like a Zalfir and Void. When it enters the battlefield, I get to scry, and that's so much good value, but it is at a weird tension with some of the other cards in the 99. So there are just some of those very strange uh, effects where, yeah, the, the cards in the 99 are certainly dictating the effects, even without it being necessarily landfall. Some of those uh, cards in the 99 secretly want you to have more basics and definitely not less. Well, a, a good example of the same thing, Joey, where a, a card wants you to have more basics, um, I have an Athreo Shroud Veil deck that's basically built around the old card Pestilence. Um, so I'll spend a black mana, do a damage to all the things. And it's a black and white deck, so I have a bunch of ways in white to prevent myself from taking damage from either non-combat sources or black sources. Um, so number one, I need to be able to produce a ton of black mana in that deck, so I want a limited amount of utility lands. But number two, because the deck's built around Pestilence, and there's really only one Pestilence, I have to rely on similar Pestilence-like effects, uh, one of which is an old card from Ice Age called Withering Wisps hmm. that's very similar to Pestilence, except for it, it cares about the number of swamps. I can only deal damage equal to the number of, of snow-covered swamps I control. Uh -huh. So again, I need to have a bunch of swamps in play, even if I'm making that mana from some other source, it's capped at the amount of snow swamps that are out there. So I have to have a bunch of snow swamps in that deck. It's it's demanding. I guess they're technically not entirely basics. They are snow swamps, but it's still demanding. I have X amount of swamps in that deck. So that's one where 
I, I'm by, by virtue of the deck is built, I am required to run a bunch of swamps. And then once I got to that point as well, then I started running the card Karma. That's an old enchantment that deals damage to everyone based on the amount of swamps in play. <laughs> um, because I have ways to prevent that damage. And I was already running Urborg and the card Blanket of Night that does an Urborg thing and makes all lands and lands into swamps. I was running those to further perfectly fix my mana so every land could tap for a swamp. So why not give everyone damage based on the amount of swamps that I've given them from the Blanket of Night or the, or, or the Urborg as well? Um, so again, like I, I want to, to have basics to help myself. And because I'm doing those things, it's let me use that kind of offensively against other people. Well, and, and we have a legend, too, that cares specifically about basic lands. Uh, Phylath is one that mm -hmm. we just got recently that uh, you create all your plant tokens for each basic land you control. So you're actively incentivized by the card in the command zone to be playing as many basic lands as possible because that's just benefiting what Phylath does when it comes into the battlefield. So it, there, there are commanders that specifically are rewarding you for playing more basics. Oh yeah, honestly, my experience having brewed around with a Phylath deck encouraged my challenge for uh, for this week about feeling like, hmm, Command Tower, I don't know. But like Phylath also could appear in some of those uh, Omnath decks too. So like those are, are other things in the 99 that will influence it. So th there's certainly a lot of it. And Dana, it's really nice to hear some of the cards that will encourage you to, to play more of the basics. It's nice to know that there are those conscious strategies, those choices that you are definitely making. And that it's not just... You know, we always encourage a lot of intentionality with the specific card choices that we make in our deck. But but now I kind of want to plot twist this on Matt. Um, I want to turn. I want to inverse my question here. Like I asked Dana, what are some things that encourage you to play even more basics? But Matt, what are some things that would encourage you to be a Dana? Like what is a, a thing that would make you play? What did you say? Like six basics in a two color deck or something like that? Do you have any of those instances where you're like? I, I think it's actually correct for me to play way fewer basic lands and have a lot more utility or, or color fixing lands. Is there anything like that for you, my guy? Um, I mean, just the fact that they keep pushing all of these non-basic lands. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> okay. the, the power ceiling is just going to get so high that you're just kind of forced to do that. Uh, and cost. I, I mean, Besiege Who Endures is a $35 card where you, you can get it. Cardkingdom.com slash EDH rec. Uh, there's that. <laughs> uh, but all, yeah, the, like eventually these are just going to get so powerful that you're almost incentivized not to be playing them. And also, too, and I think especially with the more colors that you're playing, you need mana fixing. It's kind of more of a premium. You've kind of mentioned that already, Joey. And so when we have multicolored decks, there's going to be cards like the new charms that we're getting in New Capenna that are very mana intensive. So you need one of multiple colors to cast them. That's continuing to develop as well. So if we're having cards that have three uh, different mana colors in the casting cost mm. that's going to also incentivize us to prioritize mana fixing rather than just being able to get the basics into play so it's it's a give and take where eventually the cards are going to be so powerful that you want to be playing these double green double blue double whatever uh like the ultimatums those are also very very difficult to cast type of cards sure but when you do like it, it's worth it because you you get this massively powerful effect but you do have to make sure that your your mana base can handle casting that when you need to be able to be casting it. That that definitely makes sense. The very strict casting costs, like it, it's hard to go from playing true conviction on one turn, which is triple white, to like holding up mana for a cryptic command on your next turn, and then on the turn after that, try and playing a Sarah's emissary, which is again triple white. Like uh, doing that dance is difficult without a lot of color fixing in your deck. So I can totally see that. I can absolutely see that. There's a very obvious example in my own experience here about a deck where I'm playing even fewer basics than Dana, and that's the card Hermit Druid in my Mimeoplasm deck. But this feels like I'm cheating to even mention that because that is a card that specifically wants you to have as few basics in your deck as possible so that it will mill you even more when you're trying to dig down to find one of them and it just plops a bunch of creatures, uh, excuse me, a bunch of cards into your graveyard. And, and that is actually a card where like the knowledge that I'm playing Hermit Druid causes that domino deck building thing that we've talked about in some past episodes where... I have so few basics in this deck because of one other card in the 99, and that influences, the number of basics influences the type of ramp options that I'm playing in that deck because I can't play a lot of the typical ones that would find me basic lands because I would run out and then Hermit Drove would kill me instead of milling me. Um, but there's an even more 
specific example here that I think is kind of interesting in my own case about Yannet Cryptic Sovereign. Uh, that's another deck where I feel like I am very, very discouraged from playing a lot of basic lands, not just because it's a three-color deck, but because that's a deck that plays uh, odd mana spells off the top of my deck for free if I flip them. And so that's a deck where I want to play a bunch of those Zendikar MDFC lands, like Emiria's Call or Seagate Restoration. So every basic land that I have in that deck, anything that isn't helping me fix my colors or set up the top of my deck with scries, or that is potentially a spell that I could play for free off the top of my deck, like those are other examples where I do want to play play as few, not lame lands, but ability-less lands as possible because of the demands of the commander. A specific example that occurs to me as a reason to be encouraged to run non-basics in a deck, for example, is in an artifact deck, the card Forsaken Monument is really, really strong. Oh. It's a five-mana artifact, colorless creatures you control get plus two, plus two, so it's, it's an anthem for all the artifact creatures you're running. Um, whenever you cast a colorless spell, you gain two life, but maybe more importantly, whenever you tap a permanent for colorless mana, you add an additional colorless mana. So basically, it makes all of your non-basics that can make colorless into a soul ring, functionally. Um, if you are playing in a deck with a ton of artifacts, number one, you're punished a lot less for having colorless sources because you just demand less colored mana. But number two... If you are already doing all of those things anyway, if you are already not being punished for for not having a bunch of colored mana and you're already taking advantage of playing artifacts and artifact creatures because that's what your deck is doing, then Forsaken Monument kind of encourages you to lean further in that direction. You're like, well, there's really no downside for me to run a bunch of a, a bunch of non-basics. And there's a huge upside if I have three or four or five of those lands out and I drop that Forsaken Monument. I'm suddenly able to produce an extra, you know, five or six mana per turn. That's huge. So that's another one that jumps out at me that that I've specifically experienced where I, I've made a choice to only run a couple basics in that deck and to be conscious of the fact that the, that the lands I am running can make colorless mana because there's no downside. And that one card alone is enough of an upside that, that it really makes it worthwhile. Yeah, I, there's just so many things that are rewarding people for playing non-basics at this point and even like i said we, we already talked about how the things that were de-incentivizing people just aren't really played and they're kind of getting pushed out of the format but there also just aren't enough cards rewarding people for playing more basics i think that's another thing too is there, there are more things rewarding you for playing non-basics yeah. like yes you you like green especially yes there's there's cards like primal bellow and, and blanchwood armor that give you a uh, benefit for each force that you control but there's not a whole lot of those in every single color uh so when they are they're they're typically pretty great cards like defile that we've we've mentioned on challenge of stats before but yeah, if, if there were more of those, and we've talked about this in, in kind of a, a theory crafting idea of people don't play a lot of monocolor decks because you're not really rewarded for doing that. So you're just hamstringing yourself by playing fewer colors. And so we're maybe rewarding people for playing fewer colors might be something that WotC can kind of turn the corner on. And then we would find reasons to be playing more basics. I, I can totally get on that, especially because of how, I mean, heck, Dana, you just mentioned artifact decks right there. There's like artifact decks are very subliminally encouraged to play as few basics as possible because there are artifact lands, which will increase your artifact count. And that will help out the effects that you have, like Bronze Guardian, uh, which gets bigger for the number of artifacts that you play. So your artifact lands right there in your mana base have just got here an ancient den that is going to subtly tick that up. Or there are those uh, Modern Horizons 2 uh, dual artifact lands, too. Like a bunch of those will also uh, certainly influence that. And that's just sort of almost a core thing to the strategy. And it really takes like a, a, the the disincentivization takes more on the form of like the bane of progress or a dockside extortionist on the other side of the field taking advantage of all of your non-basic lands and and, and that's a, a very difficult balance and matt i would love what you said there about trying to find um, more of a reason to be playing the the basics in terms of the card design because i think you're right that it is a a, a space that could be fleshed out a whole lot more and <laughs> And I guess, frankly, like this, and this has been an episode for us about the tension between playing basics and non-basics, but like there's no right or wrong answer here. And frankly, that tension is one of the most fun parts of deck building. Yeah, weigh, weighing pros and cons and just finding out reasons. Okay, I'm limited here. So how can I work around that? That's a, that's a deck building challenge that that's a reason a lot of players play commander specifically to have these deck building challenges and finding ways to jump through hoops to make things work. Uh, I know that that's something that I, I like and keep in mind whenever I'm brewing. And so when we keep getting all these multicolor commanders that 
have no downside. You're you're rewarded almost because you're getting to play this wildly powerful commander with access to five colors. There's no reason to be playing monocolor commanders anymore. You touched on this a few minutes ago, Joey, but I, I do think it, it's important to once again talk about the importance of intentionality. Mm. I don't think you are necessarily wrong running a bunch of non-basics or, or wrong to run a bunch of basics. Um, I, I do think it's much easier on a newer player to play with a lot of basics. It's less decision-making, less things that can go wrong. Um, but I, I think as long as you know why you're doing what you're doing and you've thought it through, I think that's really the important part. There are just a lot of factors here. Your meta matters, your play style matters, your brewing style matters, what you're trying to do with your deck matters. Uh, I, I just think the fact that, that that you've sat and thought about why you're doing what you're doing really, really probably is the most important thing here. Yeah, I, I'm I'm super on board with that. Basically, what I'm hearing from you is that this debate between you and Matt will never end. Uh, yeah, right. the, I mean, <laughs> sure, sure. That that this clash of play more basics, no, will will always be the dynamic between the two of you. And um, I, I guess uh, to that, all I can say is, well, if you've been talking so much about basic lands, then ya basic. <laughs> <laughs> Am I doing the jokes right? We've been no, waiting for that you, one. You, That's... you forced that one so hard. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Just like I'm forcing the end of the show. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> With fine. that, let's call the episode to a close. Is this working, Matt? This, 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 I, this at also? least I know where you're going now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, listeners, we would love to hear from you about the non-basics that you play and what uh, tensions there are in the decks that you've got about playing more basics or not playing more basics and what influences those decisions for you and uh, what intentionalities you've got about your mana bases because it's a very interesting topic and clearly this debate will never end. So, uh, fellas, if our listeners want to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find us all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55, that's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDH RecCast, where we have guests on every single week, also telling Dana to play more basics. So uh, <laughs> make sure you tune in for all that extra content over there as well. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can find me on my other podcast, Once a Week CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us collectively together at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDH Retcast on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, if you have a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRecCast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And we want to thank our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com. Plus, you can visit Altersleeves.com slash EDH Retcast for cool, custom EDH Rec sleeves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights, but until then, remember, EDH Wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs>